things, understand that you getting through whatever you're going through is what's going to make you the person you dream of being. What's up, everybody? It's Rebecca Louise on the It Takes Grit podcast, and I have been working on this amazing lady to come on the podcast since I got to see and hear her speak uh, at a Tony Robbins event in uh, 2021. Like, she's absolutely unbelievable. I know that so many of you are already going to know who Siri Lindley is, but she's an American triathlete coach and a former professional triathlete as well. Like, she is a beast, everybody. She is the 2001 ITU Triathlon World Champion, as well as the winner of the 2001 and 2002 ITU Triathlon World Cup Series. In 2019, in November, she was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia um, and participated in a clinical trial at the University of Colorado. And that uh, she is now cancer free. She's amazing. She speaks on the Tony Robbins stages. She's a speaker. She rescues horses. But most importantly, everybody, she's just a really nice, kind, amazing person. And that's why we have her on the podcast. Siri, welcome. Rebecca, I mean, my God, what an introduction. I feel like you've just like, I mean, thank you. You made me feel so good. And I'm so thrilled to be here with you because talk about an amazing and extraordinary human being. That is you, Rebecca Louise. I love you. I love Luke. So thank you for having me. And um, what a gift. Oh, what a gift. I'm so, so happy. I know when when uh, we met for the first time and, and your wife, Beck, was there as well. Like the four of us, it was just like this like electricity. It was just like... <laughs> Like if, we were only together for like 30 minutes and I'm so excited to see you in person in August but like I just know the electricity between the four of us is just amazing and obviously Beck came on the podcast as well and the two of us could have chatted for, for hours and hours um, but yes yeah, so yeah. great to have you here and I know that my audience have so many questions for you and it's all about the grit that you need to get to where you are today so take us back to what Siri growing up who are you and and how did you get to being this person you are today talking on Tony Robbins you know stage saving horses from slaughter I mean where did it start and how do you get here just tell us your story oh my god okay well first of all I think that a lot of grit and a lot of our superpowers are born in pain sadly um, but it gives hope to people that are going through hard things, understand that you getting through whatever you're going through is what's going to make you the person you dream of being. So for me as a kid, you know, I, I, my parents got divorced when I was four. My, I'm going to make a really long story short, but my mom married this guy, um, actually was dating this guy that broke her heart. She fell madly in love with him and he left and it broke her heart. And she didn't know how to deal with the magnitude of pain that she was feeling. So she tried to take her own life. And I am a four year old little girl and I hear screaming from my mom's bedroom and I go grab my sister by the hand and we run in and we see my mom lying there on the ground with an empty bottle. And in that moment, and I remember this, this is just the weird thing, and I'm not just saying this, I remember that moment like it was yesterday. And I remember thinking, I guess I'm just not enough for mom to want to stick around. And once you make that decision at a very young age, no matter how much older you get, how much m mature you get, you know, and you're smart and intelligent, there's still a part of you that believes that that I'm not enough for people to stick around. And so for a long, long time, she ended up marrying this man. Um, they were married for 13 years. And when he asked for a divorce, you know, I'm 16 at the time or whatever I am. And I think, oh my God, my mom's not gonna wanna stick around because the last time this happened, this is what she did. So she's gonna do that again. But again, I'm 16, like I'm smart. Like I, I, it's hard to not believe these things that were born, you know, so deeply in you at a young age. So what I started doing is I, my whole life was about making life worth living for her. 
being everything that I needed to be, to make her proud, to make her happy, to give her comfort, to... And the thing was that she was okay. I made up this story in my mind that I needed to keep her alive, that it was all on me, that, you know, it, like, like it was all up to me to make life worth living for her. In her memory, it's nothing like that. She experienced freedom. She finally could, you know, do the things she loved. But because of the story I made up in my own mind, um, I put this tremendous amount of pressure on myself. And it was also time for me to go off to college. And I'd gotten into Brown University and the last thing I wanted to do was leave my mom because what's gonna happen to her when I'm no longer here? So all this anxiety and pressure had led to this extreme um, OCD. I, I had this, you know, relentless OCD where it would literally, you know, it'd take me hours to, to leave my dorm room. I had to flick the lights on and off. I had to wash my hands over and over again to, to get some horrible vision out of my mind of my mom dying or my dad dying or me getting sick. And I, I was off at college at this point, but on the outside, and we're all really good at this, outside, it looked like I had it made. I'm going to an Ivy League school. I'm playing three varsity sports. I've got friends, you know, I've got parents who love me, but I was like seriously, I was dying on the inside. Like I, I couldn't handle the pressure. I, I didn't know that I could pretend anymore. And um, and this is Tony Robbins, who, as you know, Rebecca, Luke, and I are um, love Tony Robbins, and he's been, you know, a huge impact and influence on both of our lives. But um, some of his works came out, and and there was just one sentence where focus goes, energy flows, and I thought to myself, all these horrible thoughts that I'm having, if what you focus on grows, then I'm making it even more likely that those things are going to happen. Because basically I was killing myself slowly with this OCD. And so in that moment, I, I took ownership of my own life and my own experience of life. And I decided that I am going to focus on things that fill me up, that give me energy, that give me confidence. And it meant in every single moment, changing the channel from what I feared and didn't want to have happen to what I loved and what I wanted to create, what I wanted to experience in life. You know, changing the channel from what was missing or what was wrong to what I had or what was right. And really shifting and changing the channel to what I had all the control over. And we all have all the control over, which is our own experience of life. No longer worrying about what other people thought, what they did, how they reacted, how they responded but instead focusing on how can I respond? How can I react? What meaning can I give what's happening to me? And basically turning my story around from being one that was gonna end up in tragedy to a story that would end up in triumph. And that's where I was born, I feel, in that moment of discovery that life is up to us. No one else, no one else is going to make your life good or bad. No one else is going to make any moment good or bad. It's up to you. You know, what meaning are you going to give what's happening to you? What are you deciding to focus on? And once you sit in the driver's seat of your car in life, you can make it whatever you dream it to be. So, oh my God, long answer. I hope that wasn't too much, but that's where, that's where I really started living. And yeah. I love that. And that's so key is that it sometimes is that turning point. And I think sometimes we think we've had a turning point and we haven't. How, how do you stop living in the past? I feel like there's this like bit of a, a woo woo balance right now of like, oh, you've got to feel your emotions and journal how you feel. But sometimes when you journal how you feel, all you're doing is reinforcing that you feel like shit instead of being like, how about, I because when as soon as you said where focus goes energy flows like you know Tony Robbins Jim Rohn I got the shivers because that is was like a game changing like quote that really shifted my yes. mindset because if you are focused on the on the challenges or the trauma of the past I think I think we use the word trauma a lot because we're yes. like I'm suffering with trauma well if you keep reinforcing that you're suffering with trauma are you just going to 
keep suffering with trauma? Like, how do you get the balance between, I got to feel how I feel, but I've also got to change my state and get on with it because today could be my last day. How do you and negotiate that? Because I think that's a very sensitive thing right now about self-care. Well, here's, it's making a commitment to you. You know, the most beautiful act of self-love is to take the pain of the past and think about what was the gift in it? And yes, I mean this. What was the gift in your horrible pain? I mean this because I wouldn't be who I am today if that hadn't happened to me. If I hadn't gone through that, I wouldn't be the resilient, relentless, gritty, you know, passionate, um, empowered woman that I am today. So yes, you know, feel your feelings, but then decide, I don't want to feel this anymore because I deserve more. I deserve to feel happy. I deserve to live this life, you know, excited about what I'm going to create. So in order to do that, you need to look back and give what happened an empowering meaning. Who wouldn't you be today if that hadn't happened? What wouldn't you have achieved in your life if that hadn't happened? Use the pain to recognize how that pain inspired you to become someone that you are so proud of today. You know, my character, my strength, my resilience came from moving through that pain. Mm -hmm. And, but really, like I said in the beginning, it's a commitment to you. It's a decision where I don't want to suffer anymore. I've suffered long enough over that trauma, that pain that happened in the past. And I choose joy. Mm -hmm. I choose to make, you know, and it's all about story. Like what story in life do you want to live? Do you want to live a story where you are the victim? Or do you want to live the story where you are the victor? Like that's up to you. Mm -hmm. And you get to go first in deciding what story in life you want to live. And for an example, Rebecca, I mean, you know, I get diagnosed in 2019. It was a complete shock. My doctor calls, Bex, my beautiful wife is standing beside me. And he said, y you have acute myeloid leukemia and a genetic mutation. And this is going to be, you know, really complicated to treat. Now, his words and the way he was saying it and my wife's reaction, wailing, crying, screaming out loud, objectively as i listened and watched i thought the story they're telling me right now is that your life is over this is the end but in that moment as devastated as horrified as like panicked as i was i thought i'm not willing to live that story and even though i didn't believe it in the moment i said this isn't my time to go i'm going to survive and i am going to, to thrive that was a story that I was willing to live. Now, you may ask, well, well, did you know that? And I'm, no, I was absolutely devastated. I was I was in agony. I was shocked. I was I was I was just it was the most horrible moment of my life. But I didn't have a choice because if I listened to the story they were telling me, I wouldn't be here today. So what you do is you write that you decide on the story you do want to live, which was I'm going to survive and I'm going to thrive. And then you role play it and condition it and become that person that will survive and will thrive. So it's all in your hands is what I'm trying to say. And it's making a commitment to you. And it's saying I've suffered enough and I will no longer suffer. I will be the victor, not the victim. What were your daily conversations with yourself like? Because I feel like when someone has, I like how you said trauma, because it's like trauma's so over you. Like I do that too, but it's just like trauma, challenges, heartache, all of those things. Is there a time where you had to catch yourself from talking negatively about your trauma? Because I feel like a lot of people say, I want to be this kind of person. I want to get to this goal. I want to do this. And then there's spurts where they're positive about that person they want to be, but yet their daily actions and narrative and conversations that they have with themselves are still talking about the thing in the past because that kind of gives them significance, that makes them feel comfortable, and it's actually harder to stretch. 
What did you have to do on a daily basis when you wanted to say, oh my goodness, like, I can't believe I've just been diagnosed with, with cancer. This is it for me. Like, did you do it? Did you do something that made you change your narrative? Like, how did you stop saying those things and only say positive things? So one thing, and we all have bundles of this discipline, the same discipline that you use to wake up every morning, go to work, do a great job, come home, get your workout done, go to bed. Discipline in every single moment. I mean, truly, in every single moment, I had to ask myself, is what I'm focusing on going to lead to me surviving or is it going to make me feel worse? And if it was going to make me feel worse, I would change the channel, change the channel, change the channel, change it all day long. So number one, awareness, understanding, catching yourself. You know, and I tell the story how, you know, I I was in a hospital bed for a month and a half. You know, I'm I'm literally hanging on by a thread, 25 pounds, you know, lighter than I am now. So sick, so weak, so afraid. But I would catch myself dwelling on how sick I felt, how scared I was. And then I would ask myself, Siri, is this is this making you feel worse or better? And I thought this is making me feel so horrible. I feel hopeless. So I would change the channel. First thing that you can change the channel to is gratitude. What can you appreciate in this moment? And I had my mom who slept on the couch every single night, my wife who was there through all of this, my doctors, my nurses, my sister who donated her bone marrow, the umbilical cord, like anything that I could grab onto that I could appreciate. And when I started focusing on that instead, it gave me energy. It gave me hope. It made me feel strong. But this was happening, Rebecca, in like every single moment. It is up to you and it's discipline. You take the same discipline that you put into other areas of your life, into changing the channel and managing your focus, you will get where you want to go. Is it easy? No, it's a, it's a practice. But what happened is over time, it became less and less that I had to, you've got the clicker in your hand. Well, you wouldn't know what a clicker is. You're too young, but a clicker is like the remote control. You have it in your hand and it's up to you to catch yourself And if you don't quite have that keen awareness yet, think about the moments where you're feeling down or you're feeling, you know, uh, fatigued or just, you know, negative. You're thinking a bad thought. So what is the thought that you're thinking of? What are you focusing on? Change the focus to something that gives you strength, something that gives you hope, something that empowers you. But this has to happen in every single moment. It's like training or, you know, horses. Like with a horse, if you're training a horse, you can't make a bad behavior okay sometimes, but not okay in other times. Maybe it's like parenting too, I don't know. But if you want to get the right result, you've got to every single time catch the bad behavior and replace it with a good behavior. Every single time until suddenly they're no longer doing the negative behavior, they're only doing what you want. Same thing with your mind. And It's a commitment to you. It's making the decision and it's using your discipline in this area. And I guarantee you, each and every one of you, you have everything you need inside of you. You put this discipline towards changing the channel on your focus and on your thoughts and it will change your life. It is. It's building the muscle. Like it's building the consistency because, you know, for, for me, when I used to kind of get, emo- I mean, emotional, like all of the, I would go from like zero to like a hundred and it would happen like all the time. And it would take me a long time to get over it. In fact, it would kind of be that spiral, be like this thing bad happened. Then I'd be mad at myself for being mad at myself. Then I'm mad at myself for the thing. And I can't even remember what it was, but now I'm better at like catching myself on the first five seconds and letting that go. My question to you too, Siri, is why do you think people hold on to something in the past because I think that that can make um, some people who are going through some stuff right now they're not letting go of it and maybe they're not aware of it but why do you think some people like to hold on to that and don't want to they say they want to change but they don't but why do you why do you think some people hold on to that so my belief and people may not like hearing this is it's fear that you will no longer have an excuse 
as to why maybe you haven't had the success that you dream of, why you haven't had that depth of love that you've always wanted. Like when we blame something that happened in the past or someone that hurt us in the past, we become completely disempowered. And that blame only leads us to being less than what we are meant to be here on this planet. So when you forgive, even those, and yes, I mean, even those people that have really hurt you, that you'll never forget. But when you forgive, that forgiveness is for you. It's not necessarily for them. The forgiveness is for you because you are breaking the shackles of, you know, the prison of disempowerment that comes with blaming someone for everything that's wrong in your life blaming someone for why you haven't succeeded or why you haven't loved so when we forgive we are cutting the cord and we're letting that go and suddenly we are standing in our power again mm -hmm. suddenly now we get to create re remember you get to go first in deciding what's possible for you what you're capable of what things can mean to you or should mean to you you get to choose so holding on to that pain, I hate to say it, but it's giving you an excuse. Mm -hmm. It's giving you an out. And you're more than that. Mm -hmm. You're more than that. You deserve more than that. But until you let that go, and, and part of that is, is looking at it and saying, hey, you know, I've been blaming this for everything bad in my life, but I also need to blame it for all the good in my life too. And again, that's a shift in focus, focusing on what's good because that happened. What is the gift in that? Who did you become that you wouldn't be without that? But again, it's an act of self-love to say, I'm more than that. Mm -hmm. And as long as I hold on to this, I'm not standing in my power. And as soon as I let this go, I can be all that I dream of being in the future. Yeah, I agree. It's a bit like a cop out, I think, too. Well, the reason I'm not here yet is because this happened to me when I was a kid. Yes, or the reason right. this isn't here is because this person did this to me. And it's like, no, it's not. All, there's so many people who have been through worse than you and have been to triumph. I yeah. mean, some of the most incredible stories that we get to hear from you know, on, the, on the Tony stage and all over the world is like people who've been through horrific things and yet they come out on the other side. So it doesn't have to be that, well, this happened to me, so I can't get there. It's no, that happened to me, so I can get there. Like yes. all the things that make you, you know, that challenge you or that put you through a little bit of trauma, it's all there to build up your character, which I just, you know, I, I completely agree with you on that one. I love that you talk about- And like, what story do you want to live? Like, like, do you want to continue to suffer? Truly, like, what story do you want to live? Do you want to live this life? that you've been carrying this burden that's held you back from everything that you want? Or do you want to live a life where, yeah, this happened, but look what I became? Yeah, yeah, it's that like, whoo, look at me go. It, it is, it's all character building as long yes. as you want it to, to be. And I think that yes. it really is sometimes a bit of an excuse to, it's a fear, right? There is a fear. Well, I know, I, I don't think I can accomplish that. So instead of me trying, I'm just going to blame what happened to me in the past as why I've never been able to accomplish my goals. I want to talk a little bit about discipline and your, we haven't even touched on your triathlons. And I really loved it. You actually just posted um, about Heather Jackson, who a lot of my audience know about because she is a sponsored Herbalife athlete. And you, you, you guys posted about her technique. And I'm like, oh, this is so cool. Like, what's the chances? Like, I see this yesterday. We're going to be on the podcast together. Do you feel like the, where did you learn your discipline? Was it from sport? Because you were in three varsity teams, which is like unbelievable. How did you get into sport? And do you think that there is a direct correlation between, you know, sport and athletic, athleticism with like discipline as well? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I feel like every organization would benefit greatly from having somebody that has been an athlete their whole life because of that discipline. Because without it, you know, you're not going to make the progress necessary to get to where you want to go. Sports for me in college, I mean, I love sports. They were my escape because I had this incredible ability to be so present in the moment out on a field hockey field or on the ice for ice hockey that it took me away from all my anxiety, my OCD, everything, because I was fully present focusing on what I needed to do in that moment to play at the highest level. 
Um, from there, you know, with triathlon, triathlon presented itself to me as like this incredible opportunity to find out what I'm made of. I had just been, my dad found out I was gay. He was my hero. He was like everything to me. And he cut me out of his life at the time. And I was left feeling worthless because I was gay. And so I needed this sport to be a, a playing ground for me to figure out that I am worthy. I can do great things. You know, I can inspire people. I can take on something impossible. I can believe in myself. So I think discipline, when you look at why it matters to you, like why did becoming, going from not being able to swim, I didn't know how to swim at 23, and I became a world champion eight years later, like, like how did I do that? I did that because I was so committed every single day to proving to myself that I could. It wasn't really about the world. It, it, I, I was desperate to find a love for myself. I was desperate to know that I mattered and that even though I was gay, like I could be something in this world. And when you have, when you connect to why this matters to you, whatever it is, you climbing Mount Everest, why did that matter to you on the deepest level? You will show up every single day, no matter what. And you will perform what you have to perform. You will do what you have to do because it matters that much to you. Where discipline, where people suffer with discipline is when they don't really have a reason why they're doing what they're doing. And so there's nothing, you know, pulling them every single day to get it done, no matter how exhausted you are. So I recommend to everybody, and even in college, going back to my sports, like my why there is like help, I need to escape from my, the war in my mind right now. So why does it matter to you? And discipline is everything. I think, you know, when you're taking someone and, and you would have experience in this, taking someone that's never worked out in their life, you know, and they wanna improve their health. One of the most important things, and this is what I tell people, just put your sneakers on, go out the door and give me two minutes. Just go for a two minute walk. But it has to happen every single day. Put on sneakers, put on your running shoes. Give me two minutes. Because the building, the commitment, and the discipline is foundational. Like without that, you can't build up from there. And so what I find is just in that small ask, you know, they get out there and it's like, oh, it's such a beautiful day and this feels so good. And they end up going five minutes and 10 minutes and 20 minutes and it becomes a lifestyle. It becomes something that they appreciate how good it feels. But the most important thing is it's building discipline. So if you're struggling with discipline, do one thing every single day, even if it's just for two minutes, but do it every single day. And you will build up confidence knowing that you can stick to something and that you do have that muscle. You just need to strengthen it. Yeah, I think that's so true. And having a challenge to go through as well. I had a, one of my team members, she's actually a trainer on the app as well. She actually just did her first triathlon. And she was like, I just wanted to like, I, I wanted to see what I could do. She, she wasn't really a swimmer, but like she was really a biker. She ran a little bit, but she, it was just about the accomplishment to get it done. She wasn't trying to get first. She wasn't trying to, she just wanted to complete it. And that there is, there is a feeling when you complete something so physical for your personal self, whether it's a 5k, whether it's a triathlon, whether it's an Ironman, whether it's a Mount Everest, there is a feeling when you do it that nobody can touch you. You're like, I'm done. Like there's what, like explain that feeling when you, when you won, but also just any time that you've ever done a triathlon, like it's like nothing else that day matters. Like there's this, this like fire for me. I'm like, it's just the best feeling ever. Like, explain that feeling when it's like one to win, but also just to participate. Well, no, I mean, actually my first triathlon ever, I had never felt so alive in my entire life. And I came in dead last. By the time I finished, like everyone, most people had gone home. So that I wasn't winning, but I was out there. And what felt so good is that I was backing myself for the first time. I was doing something that I dreamed of doing that I was pulled to do. And I was so afraid, but I did it anyway. It was this feeling of taking a chance on me, of backing myself and of being fully present to each moment. 
Honestly, I crossed that line. I may as well won the, the Olympic gold, how I felt. But I think it is, and I hope for all of you that you do something like this, where you give yourself an opportunity to do something that you're so afraid to do, but you decide to just be in it. Just be in it in every moment, be in it, you know, give it your heart and soul and celebrate the fact that you said yes to you because there's no greater feeling. And um, yeah, I mean, that feeling is something that brings me back to working out every day. Just that feeling of accomplishment. You don't feel like doing it. Maybe you're nervous to do it for some reason, but when you get up there and you do it and you back yourself and you believe in yourself, the feeling of doing that is just, there's no words to describe it. And I think that's the thing we go, oh my God, a triathlon is gonna be brutal. It's gonna be painful. It's gonna be this, like Mount Everest. It, it is, it's like, it, there's a, it's a different kind of fun. That's how one of my guides like explained it. It's like, it's a different kind of fun, but the feeling that you get afterwards is like, it's indescribable. So I, I so agree. Like if you've never done a 5K, you've never like swam in the, like in, the, in open waters, like do something because it's kind of, it's kind of like that the reward is always going to be at the end, that feeling that you get, that you then want to go out and do it again. Even though it's brutal during the time, it's still, totally. it's, still fun. it's still fun. Totally. I, I love but one thing on that, Rebecca, I think like the words that we give, like for someone that, has never worked out and they really need to get their health in order. If they look upon working out, like working out is so hard and working out is so challenging. Working out is just, you know, this, like you're not gonna do it, are you? So it's change what working out means to you. Working out is this opportunity. You know, working out is therapy. Working out is, you know, helping me become more like the moment you just change the meaning you'll want to do it at least but so often it's just the language we use that keeps us from even trying yeah absolutely i agree as we close out here i do just want to touch on all the work that you have done for horses now you've just had something pretty huge that's happened explain to people like what it is that you do and what's just happened well it started with grit let me tell you that um, we fell in love with horses. I rescued a horse. She changed my life. And one day I thought, why did I need to rescue her? And I came across this video and close your ears. If you don't want to hear this, just cover your ears for 10 seconds. But it was horses being shipped to slaughter, like a three day trip, no food, no water, you know, in these stuffed uh, stock trailers, horses get off broken legs, eyeballs coming out of their heads. They are pulled up from the, their back legs, shot once and dismembered alive. And I, and I'm saying this with little emotion because I would start crying if, if I went there, but it is the most brutal, horrific, horrible thing that I have ever witnessed. Like no child of God should be treated in this way. Even if you were an aunt, you wouldn't want to pull their legs off, you know, while they're still alive. And in that moment, you know, I just had one horse, but Beck came up, watched the video. We both just started crying. We said, we have got to do something about this. So the next day we created Believe Ranch and Rescue, our nonprofit. Since then we've rescued 190 horses from slaughter. And the thing is, if you're not a horse lover or an animal lover, these horses have gone on to heal humans through equine therapy, people with PTSD, addiction, um, anxiety, going through big diagnoses. Um, but eventually we thought like, we can't just put a bandaid on this. We need to ban slaughter altogether. So we created a lobbying, lobbying nonprofit. So a, a 501c4. Um, and in the last three years, we have raised awareness. We've reached 84 million homes and have contacted, sent hundreds of thousands of letters to uh, senators and congressmen. And finally, it's been 20 years, nobody has been able to get this bill, which is called the SAFE Act. No one's been able to get it even to a vote, but we've got it to a vote in the House of Representatives um, through the committee uh, that it's in. And from here, hopefully it's gonna to go to Senate and be voted on there. And there is a very good chance because 84% of Americans uh, agree that horses should not be slaughtered 
especially slaughtered in this brutal and horrific way. So we could possibly this year ban the slaughter of American horses for human consumption. Beck and I, we did this on our own. We got laughed at. People told us, you'll never be able to do that. That's impossible. You've only had horses for four years. But guys, when you believe in something, when it matters to you, when you are willing to do whatever it takes to make something happen, you can do it. So don't underestimate the power of one. Don't underestimate the power of two. You passionately express what you want to create or have happen in this lifetime. You will get people on board. And we're so thankful for everyone and people like you, Rebecca and Luke, and all the people in this country that have supported us to get us to this point. But I hope to deliver the incredible news at the end of this year that we actually passed the SAFE Act and we were able to do that. And I hope that that gives hope to each and every one of you that yes, you are so much more powerful than you could ever imagine. So don't stop and think that you can't, you can. Just dig deep, believe in it and make it happen. Oh, that's amazing. Congratulations. I know how hard you guys have worked and it's, it's all paying off. And I can't wait to come visit you and the horses in, in, uh, in August. It's going to be unbelievable. Thank you so much, Siri, for your time. Thank like you. a powerful podcast. I know it's going to go down as one of everybody's favorites. And where can they find you on social media? Uh, on social media, you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Siri Lindley. Um, our rescue is at Believe Ranch and Rescue, and our lobbying team is at Horses in Our Hands. Um, but yes, just follow me, stay in touch, um, and thank you, Rebecca. You're incredible. Thank you for the beautiful work that you do in this world and the light you bring into the world, and I can't wait to see you in August. Oh, thank you so much, Sue. Well, make sure you go give her lots of love. We will put all of her social links in the description below. Have an amazing week, and we will see you next week on the It Takes Script podcast. Bye, everybody.